Hey, good morning. Thank you all for coming. Um, we're excited today to welcome Eric from Compass Prep. Eric is our friend who has been working in the field of test prep and knows more about these tests than we could ever begin to know. He's been here an extra 24 hours in Columbus because he was supposed to be here yesterday. So he's had the pleasure of being here on a really beautiful weather day um, at the Spring Hill Suites in Easton, but he said he has really found some special spots there. So we want to give him a warm welcome, a big round of applause for his extra 24 hours. And if you don't have the two things that Darnell has in her hand, let us know. We'll walk around and pass those out. We're not going to give any intro. We're going to let Eric jump right in, and we'll swoop in at the end to cover anything that is particular to Columbus Academy. Um, but without further ado, Eric. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, Darnell. Thanks for having me. It's good to see you all. I did have a wonderful time yesterday. Actually, my dad is recently retired, so he's looking for road trips. So <laughs> this provided that. And we had an extra Father's Sunday yesterday. We checked out, um, gosh, there's no kids here, right? We checked out a microbrewery in uh, <laughs> downtown Columbus, um, went to German Village, uh, may have stopped at the casino. I don't know. <laughs> So anyway, um, thank you to the weather for uh, giving us that. And uh, again, it's great to be here. I am one of those strange people who has decided to make standardized testing my career. Very strange. But I will co kind of compare it to like summer camp. Like when you're a kid and your parents force you to go to summer camp, it's fun. But then when I was in college and I got to work as a resident advisor at a summer camp, it was like stratospherically fun. So this job is so much better as an adult, I will say, working in the industry than as a high schooler. But I'm not so far removed from my high school days, I suppose, that I don't kind of remember what happens as the calendar, calendar year switches over from fall to the spring of junior year. And especially at, we work with a lot of, you know, communities like Columbus Academy across the country. Um, I'm from Chicago, so you may have heard of schools like, you know, New Trier or University of Chicago Lab School. Um, we work with a lot of Harvard Westlake kids and lots of kids in New York City. But basically, the, the same pattern kind of plays out. Right when January hits, testing becomes real for juniors. It just suddenly feels tangible. And what happens is this pernicious rumor mill starts spinning about, especially in the teen circles. And one of the joys of my job is getting to talk to people around now each year and just start whack a mole on these rumors and starting to bust some of them. Um, before we go further, can I just ask, who has a junior at CA? Okay. Who has a sophomore? Gotcha. And anyone with a ninth grader or twelfth grader? Okay. So um, what's interesting is that this year, the class of 2024 and the class of 2025 face diverging testing um, experiences. In fact, it is the biggest change to happen in the SAT's century-long history. So the SAT came about in the Roaring Twenties, and now, finally, this really is the biggest change as the class of 2025 is going to be facing a fully digital SAT that will debut with the fall of junior year, fall of 2024 PSAT exam. Um, Sorry. Fall of 2023 PSAT, spring of 2024 SAT. So I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about that test and tell you something something about it. Junior families, if you don't have a sophomore, you can basically uh, sit back and relax and learn a little bit about uh, digital testing. It's kind of will be a geeky, 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 deep, geeky deep dive into that. Um, uh, but yeah, so what I I hope everyone got our college admission testing, and um, if you didn't, I think Darnell has. Or Jen has some more in the back, yeah. In addition, this that is a it is actually clocks in I think at over 100 pages and I believe one pound each. So this is not a beach read, right? You will get a headache. It is a wonderful guide though, something that you can dip into as you sort of navigate your own testing decisions. And that's kind of maybe the thesis statement of what I want to, you know, whether you're a parent of a sophomore, parent of a junior, provide is that although the tests are standardized and that's sort of the value of them. Um, a score tells the same message to colleges, whether that score was gotten by a Columbus Academy student, by a junior, by a sophomore, by someone in California, by someone in any other state. The, the score sends the same message to colleges. So these exams are standardized and that's what gives their scores value. 
The pathway, however, to doing this really well always varies. It always varies. Every single student that we work with, we are designing an individualized pathway. So since last year, when I uh, did this talk in webinar format, I've spoken individually with, with lots of CA parents and have learned quite a bit about the uh, uh, big time, do you call it the junior speech? Right? Yeah, so that's something, that's a big obstacle, and we have made planning decisions around that. Um, for students' varsity sports seasons, or rehearsals, for uh, uh, their the theatrical performance. So, really to do this well, there is no one-size-fits-all option. Yes, there are test dates, and those are unmovable. Those are uh, kind of the, I would call them like the sort of the benchmarks of that, that you have to kind of hit and that can sort of be your guiding lights along the way. However, um, there's no bonus points for finishing this early. In fact, I, I sometimes, in, one whack of all uh, a myth that I love busting is, uh, just by show of hands, who thinks that most students get their peak scores in fall of junior year? Who thinks most students get their peak scores in spring of junior year? Couple. Who thinks students get their peak scores in fall of senior year? Yeah, in fact, that's right. Two thirds of students admitted to selective schools, OSU, Michigan, they are still submitting scores from fall of senior year, which students sometimes find a little bit eye-opening, especially around now, because everyone knows that there's those students who are native test takers, get a really high score early, and just can't help you know, not talking about it, and suddenly it feels like everyone has those sorts of scores. That's just not true, though. Statistically, it's just not true. Um, most students are getting their peak scores in fall of senior year. That doesn't mean we can all go right now and like revisit this in a year from now. Uh, no, because a lot of students who do get those peak scores by fall of senior year are doing really smart things, starting now um, and through, through the spring of their, their junior year. But it is definitely not a race. Um, no, one, no college is going to care or even give unofficial bonus points to a score that was gotten earlier or, or later. Um, so anyway, this guide is a wonderful resource um, uh, to, to, to consult as you make your own planning decisions through this. I'll also note that it's not just me who runs our Midwestern office. My colleague Langston is there too. Um, so if you do want to take us up on a consultation to talk about your individual circumstances, we welcome that. That's what we do all day um, when we're not giving, uh, uh, you know, talking to schools, we're talking individually one-on-one -on -one with families, learning about them and advising a pathway that fits students' individual college goals, their schedules, their tutor personality preferences. Um, speaking of the tutors, we staff a whole bunch of them. These are people who love working with teenagers, are really good at standardized testing, and universally are nice. Universally. Mean does not work for uh, test preparation. As I like telling students, uh, the most common thing I hear from students when they, I ask them, you know, hey, what are you looking for in a tutor? You know, what's a good chemistry match for you? They say, please, no one mean. And I get it, right? And then we, I, I often like will geek out with them over neuroscience and say that the test is mean enough, right? It is written by very well-paid, highly degreed adults. Over $3 million goes into creating sometimes a single SAT form code so they can re-engineer this belt curve distribution of scores. Um, the test is mean enough. You have to have a good team in place. You have to be a partner with your tutor in order to uh, beat this thing. And uh, what happens when tutors are mean, uh, not that we have any, but what would, would happen is the, that cerebral cortex part of the brain that's good for cost-benefit analysis and deductive reasoning and uh, focusing on a long, boring reading passage, that'll shut down. And people will retreat into the amygdala, amygdala the brainstem, and that is not good. But, you know, if we were running from saber-toothed tigers, if that was how we were judged about, you know, getting into college or not, great. But we're not. We're judged on high-level thinking skills, emotional control, time management, command of strategies, and, you know, ability to know a kind of narrow band of academic skills. Um, a good way of talking about testing is they are crude assessments of a narrow band of academic skills tested under duress. That's it. No one's testing creativity. There's even shaky <laughs> alignment with how testing is actually a hallmark of intelligence. But it is a coachable skill. And it is something that students kind of intuitively understand how to do when they have, say, rehearsed for a play and done that every day due to the theater director's command or gotten really good at a sport or learned a language. That's what it is. It's building fluency. It's not rote mem memorization. And to do that, you do have to have a really you know, positive, good, affirming um, team in place. 
Um, so in addition to our one-on-one -on -one tutoring, we also offer practice tests. We are hosting one later this uh, spring for Columbus Academy sophomores, right? Sophomores yeah. Yeah, sophomores will do a practice ACT. Um, and uh, we have AP tutoring. We also do um, have you know great tutors for all 38 AP exams. And in addition, we have um, AP practice tests in like the top 10 or so a APs. So there they are right there, and these are offered in March. Um, okay, with all that, I want to talk a little bit about why admission tests even exist. What role do they play in college admissions, and even maybe more broadly in our society? So when colleges are evaluating applicants, um, the banner of an application is of course made up of an academic headline that is constructed most heavily of grades. A common saying that in the test prep industry is what a student does over three years, freshman, sophomore, junior year, will of course matter more than what a student does in three hours on a random Saturday. Um, and so the top three aspects here are all some degree of grades. Grades, then rigor, grades and rigorous courses, uh, honors, AP, and, and so on and so forth. And then strength of curriculum, which you have in spades, of course, here. Test scores do come in higher, though, than a lot of these other aspects, um, such as extracurricular activities even. And it's not to say that any of those um, pieces beneath the yellow bar won't be the thing that shines through on a college application, the thing that really makes a busy reader at, gosh, I was, I was gonna say University of Michigan, but I, I'll, I'll do that tonight when I'm talking to a Michigan school, I suppose. A busy, a busy reader at Ohio State who, who gets uh, a glut of high quality applicants from similarly excellent students. It, um, it, it, any of those could be the thing that helps that application shine through, but having a strong enough test score, something that at least makes a busy reader give a shoulder shrug, right? It's very hard, it's very hard, even with perfect scores, to impress anyone at selective schools these days. They're a dime a dozen. Um, people at uh, you know, the, the Ivies or um, competitive schools, they see 36s and 1550 pluses all the time. Uh, so what a good test score should do is blend in with everyone else's strong score. Um, there's a saying, another saying in, in admission testing that at competitive schools, strong test scores are necessary, but insufficient. So um, grades, even though they are the most critical factor of a college application, are not without their weaknesses. This has everything to do with a two-word phrase that's a little um, taboo, maybe a little uh, risky to say, but here it is in the data, grade inflation. And this happens everywhere. It's, it happens at rigorous college prep private schools, it happens at public schools, and it's only getting more <coughs> pronounced. For the class of 2021, um, over 60% were getting some of grades given out in America were some degree of an A. Test scores, however, remain consistent. Here's that bell curve distribution of ACT scores. And uh, this is by design, the test, if, if and, and it also reveals a few hard truths about, about standardized tests. One is that not every student is designed to get a 33, 34, 35, or 36. You cannot study yourself silly and move from you know, a, an average score in 18, 19, all the way to one of the peak scores. The test, if, if one could, the test would be broken. Um, it, that, that just can't happen. So one of the common questions I get is, well, what can I expect in terms of improvement? And unfortunately, the only ethical answer anyone in my industry can give is it depends. Um, you may see broad proclamations from the industry that we guarantee X amount of improvement with uh, Y input of study effort. Uh, those are marketing, that's, that's just marketing. Um, really, what, the, what is true about testing is with a reasonable amount of effort, students can expect to maybe have the distance to a perfect score by percentile. So for a kid starting at an average score, nationally a 50th percentile score is about a 20, that student should, with a reasonable amount of effort, be able to get maybe to a 24, which would be a 75th percentile score. Um, test scores remain consistent on AP exams as well. 
here are a few different EPs, even though it's only a five point scale, you can sort of see that bell curve forming in the one, two, three, four, and five. This is important too, because um, even in APs, I've heard from <laughs> quite a few students in the past few years who are getting A's and B's in the courses, but end up getting a one or two on the test. And so for test-free context, say like the UC system, which you cannot give them an ACT or SAT, they will throw it out like hot garbage. Test-free, test-blind, that means we don't want ACTs or SATs. What a lot of students are doing to demonstrate some standardized testing proficiency is using AP exam scores. Um, and a college like Berkeley comes right out and says, we don't just want you taking the class, we also want the score, partly because they know that, again, a grade alone lacks the context of the kind of attached AP exam score. Interestingly, you may have seen some of these headlines popping up. Um, ACT scores were even lower this past year, the lowest they've been since the 90s. Um, so it's, it's kind of going two ways, where grades are getting higher and higher, test score is actually getting a little bit uh, lower. And interestingly enough, though, at higher, at competitive schools, and here's a selection of them right now, um, with the onset of test optional policies, only stronger scoring students are incentivized to submit their scores. And so when there's that selection bias baked in to the uh, reported average ranges at schools, you can kind of predict what will happen. What I'm showing you here, these solid bars, these are schools um, and their 25th percentile score when the test was required. And by 25th percentile, I mean that 25% of their enrolling students had, say at Villanova, a 1370-ish or lower. So 25% of their enrolling students. And so what happened, when schools went test optional is we saw that 25th percentile threshold start creeping up. Students weren't required to submit scores. And so a student who may have had a great score, like a 1300 at Villanova, may not have submitted it simply because um, it was beneath that 25th percentile threshold. So almost across the board, we saw score ranges at selective schools getting higher, even as, remember, on the national scale, scores were getting lower. Um, here's a good myth to dispel right now. So I've started hearing over the past few years with the onset of test optional policies that now I need higher scores than ever, right, to get into selective institutions. Not necessarily true. What a lot of schools are saying is use our pre-test optional ranges as your barometer on whether or not to submit your scores. And the reason is the national distribution of scores hasn't really changed. A 28 is a 90th percentile score. It is a 90th percentile score five years ago. It'll be a 90th percentile score uh, five, five years from now. So that still gives colleges the same message about what a student can do, um, what their maybe first year GPA in school will be, what the probability that they'll graduate in four years will be, six years. Uh, test scores do a lot of useful things for colleges when they are even calculating the likelihood that if they say yes to a student, what are the odds that that student is going to say yes back to the dance? That's called the college's yield rate, and colleges use that um, as tied to campus resources. If they over-enroll a class, there's only so much space on, on college campuses. This happened at my alma mater, actually, the University of Illinois, which over-enrolled due to test optional, and even though it's in the middle of farm farmland, there still is only so much, so much space, so many dining halls, you know, so many uh, professors. So that can really throw off a college's trajectory. If you think about colleges from the lens of that they're businesses and that they really need to be on target for the students that they enroll, the amount of money that those families are paying, and how important that is. Otherwise, it can throw off campus resources. You know, they have to hire more, more professors or have to fire professors if they under-enroll. Well then, test scores are really, really useful because they are a metric that helps colleges predict what a student is going to do. And they have decades of data using the ACT and SAT from when they required scores that helps them make those, those predictions and enroll efficiently. Um, so, when every, students have different college goals and when, I always like asking, you know, where do you think you even want to apply? Because a student who has, you know, some college goals versus other college goals, they may need to do different degrees of preparation. They may need to shoot for different scores. Not everyone needs to like 
grind it out and, and do um, an excessive amount of prep in order to try to get a super competitive score um, you know, for a uh, for what we call purple unicorn school, like in my backyard, Northwestern University. This, these columns right here, and these are all in our guide, um, is, are really useful because again, these are the middle 50 ranges, and again, the way to interpret these is these are based on enrolling classes. So at Ohio State, we see that um, a full 25% of the enrolling students have a 33, 34, 35, or 36. 50% have a 26 to a 32. And 25% have anywhere from a one all the way to a 25. No doubt, every single year, OSU is rejecting kids who have 36s and letting in students who have 18s. Um, but at least by getting somewhere in that range, students can softly check off the testing box. And again, get the best you can do with a, with a score is kind of get that shoulder shrug from a busy reader who has a stack of applications, you know, this high and they're just turning through them and kind of doing that preliminary read. Um, this is actually a little bit outdated. This is a bit of a higher range now. I think OSU this past year was 28 to 33. I checked it just recently, so. Um, taking a look then at those purple unicorn schools is again, here we see a full quarter of students are applying to Northwestern with a perfect score. In fact, uh, I'll anonymize this, but I've seen students this past year, I, or sorry, at Northwestern get rejected with 36s. It's just kind of what it is right now. And I've seen students get in with under, under 33s. So um, all one can do really is just try to get, get, get in those, those ranges. Finally, it's important to remember that colleges are not just assessing students based on their own admission criteria and their own middle 50. They're also assessing students based on um, the available opportunity that those students have had from their, their communities. So high schools often report their own internal like average scores to colleges. So colleges know uh, what a school like oh, in my backyard, you know, Glenbrook South um, has and so can kind of use that as a, as a gauge because often students, frankly, are not competing necessarily against other kids from a rural under-resourced school in the middle of Indiana, but competing against their peers for, for some of these, these spots. Uh, okay, I want to talk, I guess, very briefly about the PSAT. I know scores came back in early December. Um, the reason I want to mention this, I suppose, is uh, to toot Compass's horn for a second, probably the, the big brand at the top of our company is a guy named Art Sawyer, um, who graduated from Harvard and then set up shop in, Matt, in uh, uh, Marina Del Rey right after graduating, right on the beach. So that's where Compass began, on the beach in Marina Del Rey in Southern California, and basically is, is uh, a, they, they call him the oracle of national merit. So if you ever want a, a, a tons of minutia about national merit, um, please feel free to go ahead and check out our blog post there. He personally responds to every single comment that is left, but I'll give you the high level stuff. So the PSAT is a practice test. Um, for most students, the value of it is just getting a data point on the SAT side as a baseline. And for some students who score especially well, they can move down this funnel and potentially become National Merit Scholars. It's a long storied competition that gets a lot of outsized attention, partly because there used to be a lot of money attached to it. Um, in fact, I know it's someone who got a full ride to University of Southern California. Um, for, for being a National Merit Scholar these days, not to poo-poo money, but it's, it's down to, at competitive schools, maybe a couple thousand dollars, if that. In fact, when thinking about scholarship money attached to testing, um, basically, one can think of it, this is maybe oversimplifying things a little bit, but the more selective a school is, the less money they have to pull out in order to attract students. So here we see the Ivy League, which gives a grand total of zero dollars, to National Merit um, finalists, all the way up to Hope College, which is a small liberal arts school in Michigan, which gives close to $30,000 a year, but Hope has a close to an 80% uh, admit rate. So basically, students who took the PSAT, the way that National Merit Selection Index is calculated is by weighing it to two thirds on the verbal side. Each of these scores is out of 38. We add all of them together the 35, the 37, the 32, and um, multiply that by two. And that'll give us a score out of 228. 
If that score is high enough based on the statewide cutoff, then those students can qualify to become National Merit Scholarship semifinalists. We're, our best guess is that Ohio will be around a 216. No one knows for sure, though, until those students are in fall of senior year, usually around um, September. Uh, but again, the real value of, for most students of the PSAT is it due to vertical scaling, where even though the PSAT is out of 760, the SAT out of 800, because it is a slightly shorter and some say slightly easier test, you can trust that that scaled score out of 1520 is a useful baseline for where a student is on the SAT as well, and that's good for planning purposes. I'm gonna talk a little bit about national, uh, sorry, uh, test optional policies. Here's the current testing landscape of the 416 U.S. colleges and universities that we, we track. As you can see, um, the most popular policy pre-pandemic, which was requiring the ACT or SAT, which is now one of the least popular policies. And on the other poll, we have test-free schools like the UCs, the Cal State system, Caltech, and, and so on. Um, and then everything else is some flavor of test optional. And here's where things get interesting, because test optional policies are not monolithic. In fact, if we have students to dig a little bit into the weeds, both qualitatively and quantitatively, to really understand what that school's appetite is for test scores. So I'll show you just a range of schools. Again, mostly on the West Coast, we have test-free schools. And then here are schools that require testing. Purdue, you may have read, reinstated it um, last year for the class of 2024 and beyond. And here's a number of schools that have not yet decided what they're going to do. I call these the schools that are just kicking the, kicking the can down the road one year at a time. So you can read into that what you will, but a, in the face of a once a century pandemic, when literally students in a lot of blue states that supply an outsized number of applicants to colleges, California, New York, Illinois, when those kids couldn't test because the restrictions and the lockdowns were, were, were so, um, uh, uh, they, you know, they, they would have to drive to, you know, Wisconsin, I heard a lot of students in Illinois would have to do that. Um, in the face of all that, if colleges still are just moving things down the road one year at a time, that might not read as the most sincere endorsement of a test optional policy compared to a school um, like, well, Tufts, for instance. They endorsed a three-year trial period for test optionality so that they could gather data and see how it impacted their admissions, how it impacted their yield, and so on. So uh, this is kind of like the, the slide that's gotten me in trouble before. I was at uh, NACAC, our, our uh, big annual conference, the National Association for College Admission Counseling in, in Texas this past year, and, and shared this slide for a, a number of Jesuit college counselor, or uh, high school counselors from across the country, and uh, got, got a little bit attacked here, because what it illustrates, essentially, is if we take a look at um, a, the past couple years of admissions, here's the class of 2021, class of 2022, the admit rate with the gradient bar is the admit rate without scores, kids who apply test optional. The admit rate with the solid bar is the uh, admit rate of students who applied with test scores. As you can see as we travel along the x-axis that there's a kind of bifurcating between parity with Northeastern's early round in for the class of 2021 where there was a equal kind of walking the talk between students applying with scores and without scores. Students really were not disadvantaged if they applied without scores all the way to Boston College for the class of 2022 where we saw almost a three times admit rate advantage to students who apply with scores. Now, if any of your students ever take a, a statistics course at Columbus Academy, they will be able to pick some of this apart. And what I imagine they'll say is, well, hang on, correlation does not equal causation. Just because the mere presence of a test score seems to triple the odds doesn't mean the test score caused that tripling, right? There are some students who have strong scores that probably have strong grades, and even without scores, would have sent a really strong message to schools just by having strong grades, strong rigor, and so on and so forth. Nonetheless, um, these, this doesn't mean nothing, right? So th there still are, test scores are way too useful for schools to completely uh, uh, throw them out, and we see 
some schools, like you know, the usual suspects, Georgetown, Yale, who have been a little bit bolder and coming out and saying, look, please, give us your scores. They're so useful for us um, from, from planning decisions. So when making planning decisions, uh, to break this down into a few simple maybe to-dos. Um, should you take practice tests to determine what your baselines are? Yes, everyone should do that, see where you're at. Should you to take official exams? Most students should be trying to take an official exam. Um, should you do preparation for those official exams? Well, that depends on your baseline and your goals, but many students, if they're looking for higher scores, there is data backing the value still of those higher scores in test optional contexts. Um, should you submit those scores? Now we start getting into more gamesmanship, and this is where your counselors will be really helpful because they know uh, really what's going on on the other side of the desk. But I thought that we would actually do a little bit of a survey here just to illustrate how difficult this is at, uh, when students are deciding whether to submit or not submit their scores. So um, this is uh, oversimplified to the max. However, for illustration purposes, let's say we have a student, Sally student, who has a 29 ACT. She's doing great. She has a few Bs in rigorous courses at a college prep school. And the average ACT for her high school is a 26. She is applying to Illinois State, DePaul, Yale, OSU, and Tulane. So um, for each school, should she submit or withhold her ACT scores? So we'll go from left to right here. Uh, who says, just by show of hands, that Sally should submit her 29 to ISU? Yeah. She's well above the 75th percentile um, threshold, so probably a good idea to submit. Who says that Sally should submit the 29 to DePauw? Sure. The 29's right on the, in the middle of that, um, middle 50, in fact, on the higher end. Um, okay, now we get to Yale. Who says that Sally should submit the 29 to Yale? Okay, a few, right. Maybe you read the fine print here. Applicants who have successfully completed one or more ACT or SAT exams should consider including scores even if there's, those scores are below the middle 50. So Yale wants them regardless of where they are. Ohio State, the 29, who would submit that to OSU? Yeah. Again, this is a probably an impossible call to make because we don't know very much about Sally right now. Um, we don't know her extracurriculars, we don't know um, what, what courses she was in and so on. We don't even know what school she went to. But uh, certainly at least being in that middle 50 is a good sign. And finally, Tulane. Who would submit to Tulane? Okay, just a couple here. It's tricky, it's tricky. Um, 29, just one point beneath that 30? Yeah. Tough call. We actually had a webinar with um, one of the Tulane college counselors, and his advice was, if there's not a three in front of it, we don't want to see it. So that's what he said. Now, is his opinion shared by all his colleagues? Who knows? This guy actually uh, is now on Survivor. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> who knows <laughs> to what extent he really was uh, taking his job seriously at that point. But um, what I hope this illustrates is that there is not necessarily a right call to make on, in these scenarios. You just have to take the information that's there and choose what to do with those scores. Um, maybe the best college policy language I've seen so far comes from Grinnell. And what I like about what they say is it's, it's, it's candid yet, yet, yet transparent. So especially right here, they basically echo kind of what, what I've been saying. Um, if you think your score is an accurate representation of your ability, submit them. If you get the score you hope for and it's above average for Grinnell, so again, if it's somewhere in this range, it'll be helpful for us. If it's not, but it's above average for your high school, we still want to see it. And there's some redemptive factor in a strong test score for a potentially low, low GPA. Uh, okay. So I want to get into some practical advice first for juniors, then I'm going to talk a little bit about the oncoming digital SAT for sophomores. So 
Smart testing begins long before students ever sit down for the official exam. It begins long before students actually even start meeting with a tutor, or studying on their own, or doing a class, or whatever form preparation takes. Smart planning begins first with taking a stock of what else is going on in the ecosystem of junior year, and then building some sort of timeline test plan that is kind of woven around the obstacle course of all the other things that are going to be taking up your son or daughter's time through a busy junior year. And what I like doing is actually starting at the very end and talking about last chance testing in 12th grade. In fact, the October ACT and SAT can still be used for a lot of early action, early decision deadlines. That's the last chance to test. By the way, it's a wonderful time to test. A lot of seniors score really well there, but every year I'm in battles with seniors who don't want to take it one more time. And I'm like, no, no, just a little bit more. Um, and the analogy I'll use is I used to work in the entertainment industry and it would take forever to move around the cameras and get, this, get the actors in place and get the set decorated to, until finally when we could roll those cameras and then it'd take like three seconds to run a scene. So if it took hours to get some get ready for a, a single scene, of course the actors are gonna want a second take of this, maybe even a third take, because the cost is negligible at that point. We've already done all the setup. Testing similar, if you've done the setup, give kids a couple takes at this, and in fact, it's wise to do so because of super scoring policies as well. I'll talk about that in a second, but basically 12th grade of fall, last chance to test. Working backwards from there, most students should try to know a super score by the end of their junior year, because then they can cross-reference that score against the middle 50s of the colleges they want to apply to and decide whether to take it one more time. A super score, unlike when all of us went through this, um, I at least was judged on how I did on a single sitting of the ACT, right? I didn't even know what a super score was when I was in high school. It's totally changed. Super scoring is the name of the game these days. Over 80% of schools super score, and what it basically means is if you submit a portfolio of exams, what colleges will do is they'll cherry pick the top sections from separate sittings, and that's all they'll look at when they're gauging how a student fits in with that middle 50. Same thing happens on the SAT, take it twice. Even though the total will remain the same, that student sees a 50 point bump. Of course, everyone else is doing this, so it's not like um, you're, you're kind of just keeping up with a policy that's inflating scores everywhere. But um, good to know, and that's why I get a super score by the end of junior year. Um, having a portfolio of scores also enables students to be flexible with score choice, which basically means you send the scores to schools you want to send them to. Now, not every school does score, ch does, does score choice. Georgetown does not. For instance, they want to see your entire testing history. Um, don't worry about bombing a test, though. Sometimes students will get worried about that. Kids can get sick in the middle of a testing room. I've heard it all at this point. I've heard of a real proctor falling asleep in the middle of an ACT math section, and the kids are just looking at each other and being like, um, what's going to happen <laughs> you know, with, with our tests? So things can happen, um, uh, and, and the colleges know that. But score choice allows for some flexibility, as does self-reporting, which means that basically it's as easy as plugging in your scores into the Common App or whatever application, and you don't even have to send official score reports until you're admitted or you enroll, depending on the college's policy. So taking one more look at the testing timeline, possible third test in the fall, get the super score by the end of your uh, a junior year, which means that right now is a good time for students to determine which test, ACT or SAT, is a better fit. At Columbus Academy, you, uh, all students are going to take the SAT in mid-April, um, which is great because there's an extra kind of chance there to, to take one of those and get that super score. Um, but again, colleges don't care whether you're submitting an ACT or an SAT. Their attitude is like, you go to the store, you can buy something with Visa, MasterCard. The ACT and SAT do, do send the same signal about a, a student. I'll take a quick look at APs as well, just because these have seen a rising profile in admissions. Um, here we see that this big chart, part of the, of, the, of the pie chart, these are schools that just use APs for their original intention, which is credit. That's what, they're there. That's what they were originally designed to do. You can get college credit while still in high school. That one third blue part of the pie, this is schools that use them for credit, but also the AP exam scores for admissions as an extra data point. And this, we, we've seen that blue part of the pie grow in recent years because the College Board used to administer these hour long exams called subject tests. Um, there was a bio one, a math two one, um, French, and so on. 
And some schools would ask for these, especially selective ones. They would ask for, you know, three subject tests or two subject tests or highly recommend them. Those were retired a couple years ago. And so here we see Georgetown saying, yep, we know, no more subject tests, but give us whatever AP results you have instead. We also see that these days more juniors are taking APs than seniors. So the juniors, that green line, they eclipse seniors, that purple line, and so more scores are now admissions relevant because students have their scores by July after their junior year. Um, this, of course, matters for test-free schools like in California. No surprise that of the top 10 schools getting the most APs, there's three of them that are UCs. So preparing for APs, if you're a junior, remember that they happen the first two weeks of May, which means that April is a good time when most students will be, will be studying quite a bit for these. And the May SAT, which happens May 6th this year, is always a little tough for students who have a bunch of APs because that's a lot of testing that could happen the first two weeks of, of May. Again, um, for those top 10 most popular exams, um, we have just as a supplemental resource, AP checkpoints that students can take us up on too. Um, okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about then for sophomore families, taking a look at what's coming for you. And that's going to be the digital version of the SAT. Um, it's going to come again with a PSAT in 2023, but all those SATs in 2023, fall of 2023, when the class of 2025 is in their uh, fall of junior year, the SATs, the August, the October, the November, December, will still be paper pencil. Only that PSAT is gonna be digital until we move into spring 2024. At that point, no more paper pencil SATs domestically. It'll all be digital exams. This is why students are rejoicing. In fact, uh, Darnell, was it last year that you said a Columbus Academy junior was really salty that they couldn't take the <laughs> digital one. 45 minutes, that's 45 minutes back of a student's life um, where they don't have to be spending testing. So this is why students are rejoicing. That's a lot of time for a, for a, a high schooler. Um, they're taken on a computer or, ta or, or tablet. You still have to go into a testing center. This is not at home testing, you still have to go in. Um, and the changes to the test are that there's no more non-calculator section and the reading passages are a lot shorter. I mean, the old paper pencil SAT had stuff from the 1700s, 1800s. You get a passage from like Mary Wollstonecraft, which may be wonderful reading and a wonderful argument, but not at 8 a.m. on a Saturday morning for a, a teenager. So this is, kids are loving these shorter reading passages, shorter reading passages too. I've been jokingly calling this SAT. I mean, they're, they're so short, honestly, that it's like the essay tweet, you know? The, the reading passage is about the length of, of a tweet these days. We can say what we want about getting to college and needing whatever major a student chooses, needing to kind of slog through some difficult text, but um, for now, this is what the College Board is going to be administering. Um, colleges are supportive of these, and um, we suspect that there's not gonna be any worry about colleges not accepting digital SAT scores, and just to be very clear about what the difference is between a linear exam where every student has to march through every single question. And the exams have to be long because it takes time to parcel out students along that bell curve distribution. Here we have what's called a multi-stage adaptive test and this can be a shorter test with the same degree of accuracy because the test will change once. How a student does on a routing stage, they'll be delivered an easier or harder second stage and that will kind of bring their scores into focus much more quickly than if they had to march through every single section. So I'll actually, kind of the best way to understand this is, um, this is maybe the best <laughs> analogy I've come up with, is a microscope. So the stage one of the test is like our course focus now. Pretend on the slide, right? We're, we have uh, amoeba, paramecium there, but they're actually students' test scores. And the course focus kind of, stage one brings us into a rough understanding of those scores, you know, we can kind of get whether they're going to be maybe in the uh, 550 to uh, 650 range or a 700 plus range, but we won't be sure, right? There's 121 different values that a student can get on an SAT, all the way from 400 to 1600. We won't be sure until we go to the second stage, which is our fine focus now. Taking another look at this, every student gets this routing stage module one, and then depending on how the student does, they'll go the easier path or the harder path. 
Module 2A is the easier path, Module 2B is the harder path, and that'll bring their scores into focus. The most worry I've gotten, I think, from parents and students is, wait a minute, what if my student goes the easier path and suddenly caps their score? Well, you don't have to worry about that. The reason is, first of all, path A and path B, they have the same number of medium questions. Really, the only change is the sum of hard or easy points. So most average scoring students, whether they go the easier path or the harder path, it will still route them to the same place. Really where this is useful is at the extremes for really high scoring students or lower scoring students. To take another look at why this is so, here's an example of the routing module. This student got 10 correct, this one got 11 correct, and there, there was the cutoff, right? 11 correct, this kid got the harder path, this kid got the easier path, but overall, they ended up both out of 550. The odds of a student who should have been like a 750 scorer blowing it to such an extent on the first routing stage that they went to the easier path, and if only they got to the harder path, they would have gotten to 750, but instead they got a, you know, a 450, that's not gonna happen. The student would have had to like fall asleep, honestly, in that first um, uh, stage. So um, the, these gray bars, this is the test confidence that it knows what the accurate score is going to be. You can see at the beginning, at the very top, test has no idea. But as the student answers more questions, right or wrong, the confidence that the test has the right score becomes increased. Um, a good way to kind of, I'll talk about just one of the uh, parameters here about how this test is done. So a linear exam is very simple. You, the raw number of right or wrong answers correlates to a scaled score, very easy. You don't even need any sort of algorithms or anything. Um, an adaptive test is, is harder for a, a, to, to design, it, it, and it uses a complicated model called item response theory. Um, the people who design these have PhDs in statistics, their they're, they're, they're professional title is a psychometrician, and that's how they know, but, but in a, you know, based on a student's ability, what is the probability a student's gonna get a question right or wrong, and then the question has different weights according to that student's individual ability. So a good way of understanding this is take a look at a hard question. Here's a Brazilian player making an incredibly hard goal. And um, this gives us some information that the Brazilian player is excellent. But how would we kind of parse out between how good this guy is versus other spectacular players, Messi, Ronaldo, Mbappe, and so on, to make those minute calls between strong test takers strong soccer players and know who gets the 750, the 760, the 770, what we really need to do is give them a suite of hard, hard questions. Have them do it five times, have Messi do it five times, and so on, and then we would get some mini meaningful differentiation. Take myself, when I was in kindergarten, starting to play AYSO soccer, give me five of those, it would give and no one any information about like where my true ability was as a tester. Of course I would miss all of them. So the hard questions don't mean very much for a softer scoring student. For a softer scoring student, what we need to do is just test them with easier questions. That'll help us accurately put them, um, you know, at a 460, 470, 480, something like that, and just get a bunch of softer scoring students. Have them, have them do five of these, and that'll give us some information. Take the high scoring students, give them these easy questions, well, of course they're gonna get them right, unless they make a careless error, but okay, it's one careless error. So the careless errors won't hurt quite as much just because the test will know that it's a stronger scoring student and dropping an easy point won't hurt quite as much as it would on a linear paper-based exam. Um, for the class of 2025 then, you face a really interesting testing timeline decision and I will, I think I'll end almost with here, but with this, but uh, essentially, here are the options. One is abstain from testing altogether. There still will be test optional policies, test-free policies. Um, this is a legitimate option, just completely forgo testing. Students will get into some a, a good school, um, uh, if even without scores. The other option is to flight the flight to the familiar, just go with the paper pencil ACT. This is nice because the test isn't changing at all, and so um, we there's you know. Tons and tons of resources, good studies resources for the paper pencil ACT, so students could just forgo the, the SAT. 
The third option is for students to take the essay, paper pencil SAT by the end of fall of their junior year and uh, before it changes. This is an alluring option for a lot of high scorers. I will, I will say from experience though that most students who try to get testing done by fall of junior year don't do it. They may get a good score, but they often have high goals, and so they make a rational call to test in the spring for a super score. And so um, that means that most students who try path three probably will end up taking the digital SAT anyway, and that's okay. We strongly suspect most, most colleges, if not all colleges, will be super scoring the paper pencil SAT along with the digital SAT. Again, they're both going to be on that same 1600 point scale. Um, finally, why not take an ACT and then try an SAT and then just go ahead and, and spin a, a digital SAT because more testing is better, right? No, wrong. Most students are going to hit their peak, peak scores after a certain amount of preparation. Yeah, most kids have a soft ceiling with, with testing and just jumping back and forth between different tests, it's not going to suddenly um, you're not gonna see a, a sudden jump in, in test scores, so. Um, okay, so with that, I think I'll go ahead and wrap up just by talking about the reality of college admission testing, and that is most schools have well over a 50% admit rate. I know we tend to hyperfixate as a culture on some of those schools that deny far more applicants than they admit, but the truth of the matter is most schools will be vying for your students' attention and attendance. So um, inevitably, I do hear sometimes, and all my colleagues do too, about from, from some parents who say, look, great, we get it. Um, we'll, our, our, our son or daughter will get in somewhere and be happy, we understand. But we're going for Stanford, or we're going for Harvard. And we know that uh, we're gonna do everything we can to get a perfect score. And we're cringing because, what if you use the pronouns, because we are not taking the test, right? The student is taking the test and doing the preparation. But let's say it happens. Let's say, you know, um, this, this student uh, uh, becomes the test-taking automaton of her parents' dreams and sacrifices her weekends and her evenings and her social life and, uh, and gets the perfect score. The truth is, you know, most most schools are still not, <laughs> you know, not super going to be super duper impressed by that. So um, testing is done well when you don't give it another cent or second than it deserves, and um, if you can do it with good planning, and uh, there shouldn't be any screaming or shouting matches between parents and students to to do more and more. In fact, I've never heard of anyone say, Eric, if only we'd done more, we would have been happier got in for a dream school. No, usually it's the opposite. It's if only we'd done a little bit less. So I'll close it up there. Um, and I guess, uh, Jen, Darnell, if you have, happy to take some questions or uh, if you have some announcements. So we'll add a couple of quick things. Um, first of all, thank you, Eric. We'll give you a big round of applause. That is more about testing and test prep than you could ever pack into an hour. Um, a couple things we want you to know about the experience at Columbus Academy. Every student in the 10th grade will have an academic planning appointment in April where we'll talk about uh, what's best in terms of timing for your student. Last year, Eric said this and we echo it, there should be no test prep in the 10th grade. There should be no test prep before the end of the 10th grade. You may uh, be recommended by your college counselor to start doing some test prep in the summer between 10th and 11th grade. And for some of you students, we may ask you to wait a little bit later based on where they are mathematically in the curriculum, but we just, we just want you to keep that in mind. There is a um, saturation point for test prep. There is a saturation point for college talk. You know, this, this is a deep dive into the college testing piece, but if you come to any of our other programs, um, you'll hear us talk about keeping joy in the process. If you want to suck the life and joy out of your child, start talking about test prep in the 10th grade and you will absolutely see their face fall. Um, the saturation point, what would you guess, Eric? Like, what's, what's the most a kid can do in terms of, if you had to guess, I'm putting you on the spot. Yeah, I would say that the most Three tests over the course of, of um, until, until you're applying to colleges, and a prep program should be about three months in length, leading up to the first test. Five is too much, you're going to start getting some burnout early on, um, but it shouldn't be three weeks either, because these should not be cramped for. That only adds more stress, 
and really doesn't work. So yeah, about a three month. Um, we also want to let you know that Carla Krucka, our third college counselor, would love to be here, but today we have a college counseling class for our juniors, and it's at the same time as this program, so she's teaching the class. This was supposed to be yesterday. Um, and Darnell, you want to add something? So I, I just want to say in this whole discussion um, about test prep, it's so interesting because I think you all are smart to learn about this, but I want to let you all know that this is one piece of the picture. Okay, there we go. And, um, and so I would liken um, uh, test scores a little bit like to knowing your cholesterol level or knowing your weight. It's one bit of information that helps in your overall health and well-being. And it's important because it's an important part of the college admissions process. And I actually, having seen my kids sort of go through this together, I would say that um, one of my children actually really benefited from test prep because it helped him um, strengthen academic skills maybe that he had missed somewhat during the pandemic. So we didn't look at it as he's got to get this score to get into a particular college, but a way of shoring up some things that might have been missed. So I think sort of in terms of fine tuning um, maybe academic preparation and things like that. This has great benefit. But you have to place it in the right context. And if, um, if I'm thinking about all of the things that test scores do not measure, I would like somebody to raise their hand and say things that it does not measure. Raise your hand. Okay, Carol. Leadership. Leadership. Creativity. Creativity. Emotional intelligence, sense of humor, ability to deal with setbacks, um, a little bit of what um, Eric talked about in terms of hard work. You know, you may work really, really hard at this and still not be able to get the highest scores. You know what? There's so much more that matters in someone who works hard than um, than, than uh, getting the highest score. So please don't see this as an in sum game. See it as a data point in the overall development of your child that can tell you a little bit about where they might fit in the college admissions picture, but recognizing in a large scale piece that that is not their path to adulthood. That is not the thing that matters most overall in them. And, um, and I think that understanding these things about it, and certainly as adults, hearing what Eric has to say is so, so very important. Eric is um, happy to take questions from the audience if you think it pertains to everybody. If you have an individual question, or if you want to just talk to him privately, he'll stay around afterwards. But anybody think there's a topic that we may So for students that may find the regular course load and, and activities of school, like during the school year, a lot to do, um, is test you know, practice better done in the summer when they might have more free time? Or how would you manage that for a kid who already feels like they've got a lot going on? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, Summer preparation before junior year, it's too early for a lot of students who don't already have strong scores. So only about one-sixth of students we work with start that early. However, there's good arguments to be made for that. Junior year is really busy. Starting over the summer, if students have some time at home, they can start building up some foundational preparation. However, usually it's done in two phases then. We'll do like eight lessons over the summer and then pause them and then they'll resume around Halloween to get ready for, say, December ACT or SAT. That means that they're not prepping all the way through junior year, but have front-loaded some of that in the summer. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, SAT versus ACT. Do they take one or the other? What's the difference? Do some schools like one test? more than another? 
That's a good question, ACT versus SAT. Um, in general, the ACT is more speeded, less time per question, but the questions are more straightforward. Um, the ACT also has a science section, which is a misnomer. You don't actually have to do experiments, you just have to read graphs quickly and get the right information out to questions. SAT has two math sections, so you double down on math on the SAT, and you um, have more time per question, but the questions are wordier. So it is a pick your poison. It's like some students prefer one, some students prefer another. The only way to tell is to go into the laboratory, which is students going in to take a practice test um, or pair a practice ACT with a practice with the, with the PSAT. Yeah? So if you have a sophomore, when they take that practice ACT, so the day our juniors take the real SAT here at school, sophomores take a practice ACT that's from Compass. So they will have the practice ACT score. We share your student's PSAT score from the 10th grade. And then you as a student get, get the, your 10th grade student and they can share it with you. They get a report back that has a little gas gauge, I guess for lack of a better word, that says you favor the SAT or you favor the ACT. Some of your students will be in the middle, which I know isn't helpful, but for some there's a very clear indication like you're better at the ACT or you're better at the, AC, at the SAT. So we don't want to over test your kids but last year when we did this practice ACT, the overwhelming response from sophomores was, yes, thank you for doing that because now I know not to waste my time taking three SATs and three ACTs, I kind of know in advance which one I'm, I'm better suited for. Does, it, does that help? Do schools care? Schools do not care, right? So that's a big myth, like they care one way or the other, they don't. Every school takes both. They want um, your best score because they have to report average scores, right? So they want to put their best foot forward. They want you to send your best score. They do not want you to send your lower score because then they have it and they have to report it. Jen, oh no, no question. Just want to tell me how cute my hair looks. Okay, we were, we're gonna shut it down, but if you want to approach Eric with individual questions, he is welcome to stay. Thank you guys so much for coming.